We have two special guests coming up, but first I'm going to introduce the one and only Jimmy Douglas, everyone. Thank you very much. And there will be a second mic when the moment comes. I like this profile better. So, how have you been? Um, hello, I'm Jimmy Douglas, and thank you all for coming um, to spend this time with me. I wanted to start it with something a little different because um, I went to a uh, concert last night and there was a, a, there was a band playing, they were playing like rock and roll. They were actually playing Led Zeppelin covers and it sounded freaking amazing. Um, it's called Let, um, Watt Zeppelin. Uh, Andrew Watt, producer, a, a big producer of our day, plays amazing guitar. Uh, Chad was playing drums and so it made me remind me of some of the rock and roll that where I come from, I do a lot of hip hop, but I've also come from a rock and roll world. And um, I wanted to start it by playing a piece of something that, well, there's nobody there to play it. How about that? Okay. Um, I wanted to play a piece of something that someone that found me in Europe, in London, uh, they reached out to me and, and they thought that I probably wouldn't be able to do their project, but I loved it. I loved the energy so much and I love what they were doing that I mixed it and now he's um, about to get a very nice deal but I wanted to just share it with you. When I, last time when I heard the rock and roll I was like you know rock and roll is still alive and uh, I like to share sometimes I get projects that are just fun to do not even thinking about whether it's going to sell or take off it's just fun to do and this is one of those fun projects and uh, his name is Bo Bowen and he's from London and have a listen to what this sounds like actually there? Oh, I can play. I'm sorry. Ah. Wait for it.
won't go to the end because I asked to turn it down. However, from my generation, this is kind of why we got into recording, to make records like that. Um, don't know if you agree, don't know if you enjoyed that at all. Um, don't all speak up at once. I, for one, enjoyed the hell out of it. I enjoyed, I enjoyed mixing that and, and making it and just, you know, kind of reliving my childhood. Um, <laughs> um, but without further ado, I, uh, I have a special guest to bring to share the stage with me today. Um, it's one of my protégés, and I'm really proud of this person. Um, she's going on to be really very special and very accomplished. And I want to bring her up, and I want to kind of sit with her, and we're going to talk about a few things and see about philosophies. Uh, Marcella, and I'm not going to say it right because of that guy. <laughs> All right, guys. Ms. Lago, please step Hi, up. Guys. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, See, it's only a great mix like that that gets turned down, right? That, when it's a great mix, they're like, turn it down, turn it's too it loud. <laughs> no, that was awesome. So, um, I guess you want to tell a piece of your story, or I can tell a piece of your story. You, I would like to hear my story from your point of okay. view. <laughs> so, uh, I met Marcella back in the early 2000s, and I met her at um, Hit Factory in, the, in Miami, in a great studio. And uh, she was... Fresh out of school, full sail, and there I was mixing uh, Missy Elliott, Timberland, and a whole variety of all these, the, you know, the then, the then modern hip hop people. And uh, there was this fresh student that came out of uh, full sail, and she was very, she was actually there with an actual, you with a partner. He wasn't your partner, but you guys were like, you, you were yeah, running things as you went we to school together. We were like a together. dynamic duo. They were the dynamic <laughs> duo. And they would run the whole yard, and, uh, and they were both very good. Uh, Marcella and me, she ended up assisting a lot for me, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm very hard on assistance. I mean, I really am. I don't, I, you know, I'm like, pay attention, keep up while they're doing everything else they're doing. And uh, she was gracious enough to kind of hang in there. She would resist, but she would always come back resiliently and show me that she actually knew what she was doing and that she could satisfy the moves. And ev ev eventually, as you know, there was a lot of work going in a lot of different rooms, she'd end up being thrown into the lion's den many, many times with um, Missy. With Missy, yeah. For, for instance, you know, and she'd have to just go ahead and take the reins, and she would come back victorious on the other side. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually she kept doing the right thing, day in and day out. She was staying around after work times, learning stuff, keeping herself in there, and uh, uh, then I think... You met a client who wasn't a client. It was just more of a friend, kind of Carrie Hilson, right? Carrie Hilson, yeah. Right. She was an artist on her way with nobody to help her out. And she decided, I'll help you out. What's mm -hmm. there to lose for right. both of them? <laughs> and um, they ended up having a relationship. I mean, musical relationship. Friendship. <laughs> a, a friendship. There you go. Um, but a musical relationship together, doing stuff, doing demos, doing songs, doing this and that and the other, till eventually... Uh, Carrie, well, no, you can take it from here because I'm confused. Well, though, before I, I met Carrie, basically Timberland, he had a protege come in um, by the name of Danger, and that sort of that working relationship started. And then we met Carrie, and then together we sort of started songwriting with her and building out her project. And you know, the rest is sort of history. Um, working with Jimmy was. It was, it was tough, you know what I mean? Like, it was tough. But um, I recognized Jimmy's work pri uh, based because of the artists that he worked with. I knew the mixes that he's done in the past. So for me, like, I didn't care how much he would, you know, be hard on me. Like, I was going to just keep it going because just to be in the room with him and learn quietly in the back and just kind of tune my ear to what he was doing was golden to me so I mean I really I credit you all the time he's my mentor he always says I'm not your mentor I'm like yes you are but you really are you let me you ask did. you a question sure then this is to see it from the other side so all the time that I was in there doing stuff did I actually literally look like I knew what I was doing <laughs> yeah you did oh, okay. I will say and I will be honest Jimmy when he came down to the uh, hit factory in Miami he was working on an SSL and I think that's where you know, we, there was a lot of trouble there. 
because you were a Neve guy. I was a total Neve guy. You were a Neve guy, and I had to help him through the SSL automation and all those types of stuff. So, yeah. Right. Other than that, you were awesome. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> so, so now you, you, uh, you're all grown up and out to pasture. No. Yes. But, so you, you actually um, are a part owner of a studio. Yep. Uh, with Danger, right? Correct. And it's one of the finer studios in Miami, even though it's not Thank really a public, public studio. Um, yeah. Dream Asylum. Dream Asylum Studios in Miami. We opened the doors in 2014. Um, it's an amazing three-room facility. I have two SSL 9000s in two rooms, and I'm SSL Matrix in the other. And, yeah, it's not a public studio. It's not like a hit factory, but... You know, we do open it to clients and whatnot, and I mean, it's an amazing place to work. So, and if you got songs like the one I just played, you can come there. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, the, the the question I wanted to ask you though was like, um, for me, in this modern world where everybody who's sitting in this audience can have a laptop and they can make their own music without me or without anything else, um, it's really hard to find the kind of help that I had from you back in the day, which was an assistant, a dedicated person who actually was there to kind of watch behind you and help you do what you needed to do to bring people, you know, to keep the, to keep the ball rolling. Um, yeah. I find a lot of people that come in that I want to work with, they really don't want to really learn this craft anymore. They just want to be the producer Correct. and make the money because you Correct. can very easily. So that being said, do you have a lot of assistance at your studio? <laughs> I have three assistants at my studio. Um, it's been tough, though. It's a tough road because that position is so revered and I don't feel like people really take it seriously like they used to. It's really, really hard to find someone that really wants to, like Jimmy said, learn the craft. They're either walking through the doors because they want to be something else. They want to be an artist. They want to be a producer. They want to be a rapper. So this is their way in. And, you know, when I need this person to be, you know, assisting me and their heads are in the clouds dreaming of the rock star that they're going to be in the future, it just sort of doesn't, you know, match up. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I have three assistants, um, but, you know, for the three different rooms and whatnot, and they, um, you know, but it's, it, it, it's, it's definitely been a revolving door from times, at times, for sure. Um, so the other, one of the other factors that I do find, which can be helpful, and it can also be kind of, um, um, it kind of derails the process, is a lot of, you know, listen, there's a lot of information out here. Like, for instance, this very thing we're doing right here didn't exist back in the day. You couldn't just go get information from those that were making records you would have to figure it out for yourself. Now you can scurry online, or you can come to Mix with the Masters and hear people talk about their right. process and what they're using, so now you have a, you know, you have a mark to work towards. Um, but that being said, we all work a little differently in our process. Correct. And one of the things I do find of the quality people that come in my door, they watch my process, and I have to be honest, I'm a, I'm a self-taught person from, you know, from back in the day was self-taught and now a lot of people go to school so like they know how to use all the soft keys and what they don't understand is I've been watching these companies grow since they started and for years they would change the soft keys every time they came up with a new version and after a while it made me crazy so I stopped paying attention and I just figured out a way to make it work however the kid that comes from school walks in the door and watches Jimmy fumbling around I'm not fumbling I'm going at my own speed and it makes them fucking nuts. Just, you know, there's a key that does this and does that. I'm like, yeah, I do know that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can you, like, leave me alone and let me go to work and watch what I'm doing, maybe? Yeah, I'm um, one of those. Are you one of those? Yeah, and you need quick keys. Yeah, you got to have I the can't, quick keys. I can't watch that. That's grueling to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we didn't. Well, 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 I didn't use quick keys back in the day, really. I was right. like a slow boy. You, I'm a slow boy. Uh, see, now that now the truth comes out, you see, it's just like, <laughs> yep. Yep. Listen, Jimmy came in. Remember, Pro Tools was now becoming the industry norm. It was, yeah. So that was another. Like, Jimmy came to Miami working on an SSL. He wasn't norm to the SSL. And Pro Tools no, was No, but I had the Pro Tools rig. Well, you had a Pro Tools I had, rig, I had a better still, rig. I had a better rig than Hit Factory had, if you remember. I will definitely say yes to that. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I just didn't want to use it. Correct. <laughs> yeah. So. That's funny, 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 funny. So... <laughs> 
while I have you here, I want to talk about a process. And I figured maybe instead of me doing mine, I play a song that you probably only heard once or twice. And I want to just get your take on how you might approach some of this stuff. Is that okay? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, okay. So, I have, I have here a mix from a, a guy named, uh, um, his name is Judah Holiday. He's a, a, a local, he's pretty good. He's a local kid from Miami. And I, when I actually left, I was actually working on this particular thing, so it's not even done yet. And I figured while I'm here, maybe I'll open this up and I'll just have uh, another professional's take on how this might come out. Of course, this is not a real place to do it because you can't hear nothing. Can't hear and they anything. won't let you turn the music up. So why are we here? But um, <laughs> um, So without further ado, I'll start to play a few of the pieces. and Let's hear it. When I was 16, I spent most of my time smoking cigarettes and gasoline. Falling in that love was a little rough. Damn, what a memory. She was losing her mind every other night, living in a fantasy. I let her ruin my life for another ride. That's cool. So, it's a cool, cool little tune. It's, it's kind of hard with all this bass floating I, around the room. I, I know. Don't even, I don't know what's coming out of here. I don't know. Well, um. yeah. <laughs> what do you guys think? Yeah? So, <laughs> so <laughs> any thoughts about what it sounds like, the how it gets out and improve what it sounds like? Um, all, um, that's, all that's really there is like on the master, there's a couple things. Uh-huh. Um, I know, mean, for me... Let me explain. For me, mixing is, is, is and I, for some of you that um, may have followed me through my career in interviews, I talk about mixing being, it's, you know, I'm one, it's a very emotional process for me. So for me, you know, if I was to sit in the studio, I would be listening down to this song in its rawest form a few times. Um, I wouldn't be touching anything. I might just be adjusting certain levels or whatnot. But I really want to get the emotion of the song. Um, and I really try to figure out what direction I want to go in. Uh, for this song in particular, I mean, I am just heard it like one half of a time. But, I mean, those snares, you know what I mean? The, the snare and the clap, I would want them to kind of have a more of a, you know, slap and crack to them. Um, and I, I feel like a lot of that comes from me, you know, being brought up in the hip-hop R&B world and the Teddy Riley and all that. Like, I've always just been a big fan of the snares and the claps. So, for me, I would probably achieve that. Um, I'm a big fan of distortion. I love to dis you know, just add a little bit of distortion to just kind of bring those harmonics out. And you know, I would probably use, let's see. Let's see. Well, first of all, I'm just trying to find my way around the. Um so basically, everything is bust to 25 and sit 26 as an output, and that's going through one and two after. So, so you you instead of when you put, make the C there, aux two, make it go to 25, bust 25 and 26. That's 25 the output. 25 and 26. Yeah, you're right there. Yeah, yeah, to the right. Yeah, bust 25 and 26. There, yeah, there. Yeah. So right. basically, that's how I'm staying in the box. Basically. Okay, no, I got you. Okay. okay. I mean, basically what I would do is, I mean, I would either create, I would bust the, the snare and the clap through an aux, or I would just put the, you know, plugins on it. It just kind of depends. Um, so if I, okay. Okay. 
No, it's really hard to do. I know this. Yeah, yeah, you can change that. Yeah, and then you can. Yeah, that's fine. Lo-fi. Hi fi lo fi. Okay. Already gives it a little crisp crasp. Enough stuff. So I love the LA-2A. I mean, there's a lot of different plugins that I like to use. But like I said, what I'm trying to achieve is for the snare, the clap, that two and the four to have a nice smack crack to it. So like I said, I like to achieve that doing a little bit of distortion. Um, you know, adding a little bit of the gain. And sorry. I like, I like. That's before. And that's after. You the night. You the night. Who's the line every you the night? Living in a fantasy. I let a ruin my life for another ride. Get my insecurity. Kind of nice. Yeah, that's, it oh. just kind of gives it, you know what I mean, because that's where your groove is at, you know what I mean? So you really, for me, like, it's so important that that's kind of in your face, and that's what's really kind of making it all move. Um, so, I mean, that's one way that I would achieve that, just off first listen. So No, I, mean, I, I can feel the difference already, actually. It's, yeah. it's got me swagging differently. Right, it it's, just kind of brings you know? it, it, it brings it all forward, so. So it's all about the swag. Yeah. Check this out, there's this thing... Uh, What? Uh, wait. No, there's more. Oh, there's a whole shitload of stuff in here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to hear, but this sound right here, I'm just to get your take on it. It's what they recorded, but this is one of those things that's, I guess it's the opinion of the the artist doing it. Oh, I love sounds like this. So. Well, you can't hear because everything else is. Ever I know. Hey, turn that down. No, but so. Um, it's kind of like got a crackling distortion, it, <clears throat> distortion right. in it. And so how do you feel about shit like that? I think, um, I think at first, if I was to hear that sound, it would bother me. But in the context of the full mix, after I start balancing things out, I would find a place for it. I think I would be okay with it. Um, but sounds like that, like you can really take them places. You can do whatever you want with them. So like those type of sounds, like I just start adding things just to see what happens, just to see what kind of, you know what I mean? So like, I mean, I love, I love just experimenting um, with uh, modulations. Let's try that. Well, also you like, you know, when it comes, a lot of people always ask me like, do you got, like, they're so loud. I That's feel like right. I'm. She's real. That's acoustic. It's okay. It's all right. Um, I hope you guys can hear me. Um, you know, when it comes to like plugins, a lot of people ask me like, "Do you use the presets? Is it, is, is it like fine?" Oh, absolutely. Like, I think presets are there to kind of give you a starting point. I use presets all the time because, I mean, I can either just start twisting things around and seeing what happens, or I can like go to a really cool name in the presets. Like, I always like to go to the presets because I like the way people name things. Like, I just find, I'm like, oh. And I really just go to them. It's like when I buy a bottle of wine, 
I don't know what wine I'm buying. I just like the label, so I'm going to buy it. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, that's kind of like how I choose presets. I'm like, all right, so I pull up uh, Filter Freak and blah, 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 blah. all right. And let's see, effects. Let's just see what happens if we add <laughs> the swell guitar. Let me bring down the mix so we're not overpowering it. And let's see what it sounds like. I mean, it's not going to do anything different with that distortion that little crackling right but i just like to see if i could take it somewhere different you know and if this is like a starting point for me like i just start you know twisting things around and seeing what i can make of it you know sometimes i win sometimes i don't but you never will know unless you really try it so for me it's like when you mix and you're really into it and i say it's a part of an emotional feeling like I really start getting into it. I get in there and I just really try to like go where I want to go with it. You know what I mean? Because when you get hired as a mixer, people want to take, you know, like they don't want you to totally flip their song upside down, but they also want you to have a little bit of your signature on it. Like what would you do? You know what I mean? So it's hard to kind of hear what I'm doing in here, but you know, I'm just trying to give you guys examples. Like I know you were probably like, what, what is my take on that crackling and that crunch? To me, like I said, it would probably bother me and I would try to EQ it or find like how I can kind of lessen it out. And if I can't, in the context of the mix, if it fits and it doesn't bother me overall, then I would just keep it. Right. And, yeah. and, and let's face it, they picked the sound. They picked the sound. So right. I had a very interesting story like this. In my B room, I just took a new tenant in and my tech was trying to help him set his, the speakers up. So he was going through the board to give him more, 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 a little more volume. Right. And he, and he put the mic preamp up, and he's playing the, the mix, and I'm listening. And I said, you probably need to put the pad on. And he goes, why? I said, don't you hear that distortion? Like, the whole side was crackling. And the, the client goes, oh, no, that's in the record, man. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, you would be the surprised is, what people's yeah. um, visions are for their own records. Like, what we think is wrong, because we as engineers... You know, we're like, oh, wait a minute, but that, you know, it's sort of what they want. You know what searching I mean? Searching for purity. We're yeah, always of course. We're always searching for of the course. pure sound. Um, I have another question for you. For sure. So back in the day, uh, when you started to make your move and you started to get, you know, you got some nice records, the Timberland record, the Carrie Hilson records, you want some nice stuff. And I said to you, um, Marcella, I need some effects. <laughs> And you, that's exactly what you did then. You laughed. And you still, to this day, haven't given me any. <laughs> you, you always laugh, but you never give because them to me. what was my answer? You said you have what you need, Jimmy. You know what? That's what you said. No. Okay, first of all, I don't have a template for my effects. There's not one record I've ever mixed where I use an effect, the same effect. I literally, like, craft, like, individual effects for every single song. So I don't have like effects to give because everything is it's signature to that song. No, of course. So I don't know. It's and, like and, and I felt like you were asking me like no, I need no. a. Pre like, I was like no, I don't no. really know. And, and this many years later, as as evidence, <laughs> there's like effects. Uh, there's so many effects in the of world. Of course. But at that time, there was oh. only a handful, and yeah. I was looking for the secret of the sauce. Well, the and secret to the sauce out. was I was layering effects. <laughs> I wasn't holding out. Ah, I was layering I tons see. of effects. So it wasn't hold, one plug in that was using. Yes. <laughs> right. I still layer effects. Effects to me, I mean, that's where the fun comes in. I mean, let's get be real. You know what I mean? Like EQing and compressing and DIY. I mean, that's the stuff that you kind of have to do. Right. But then, like, the effects is what, where you kind of have, you know, fun. Get your hand in there. They want DOS effects. That's, yeah. what they, that's it. <laughs> um, so maybe um, at this moment... If anybody has a burning desire to want to ask any questions, mean, unless you have something to say, I mean... No, I'm all down for Q&A. Anybody have any uh, questions? Don't all speak at once. My goodness. Oh. I'll, uh, <laughs> what? Do I have to borrow the mic? One second. The mic is on the way. I'm just like... Uh-oh. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Howdy. Hi. So question, when you bounce out stems and you on the master, would you rather have stems with everything that you put on the master or would, would you like to have the stems without like, you know, the producer with the... Dry. Exactly. Dry, dry. versus what? Dry without anything or on the master? Like yeah. I mean, honestly, most clients, my clients, they don't master their own stems and they need them for show. 
So I keep everything on the master because eventually that's what they're going to use. You know what I mean? And it's the closest thing to the mix that they heard. Right. So I personally keep everything on, on the... Now, if the client says to me, like, can you send me the stems? I'm going to get them mastered, then I would print them without the stems. I never get that. Okay. They just take it as is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. What do you do? So, well, I, I mean, I kind of I kind of give them everything that's on there because I don't want to hear from you again. <laughs> I don't want you calling me and saying, it doesn't sound like the mix. Exactly. No, it sounds like the mix. Leave me alone. Exactly. Or do something else. Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to talk a moment to, to say something very, very um, interesting that happened. So, when I was like 18 years old, I started, I started doing this when I was 16, but the first record that Atlantic Records, I worked at Atlantic Records, and the first record they gave me to do was this kid that they signed, or this guy they signed, and um, Atlantic Records was an interesting place. There weren't no producers. You were the producer. It was just you and the artist. That's how it kind of worked. So, when you went to mix or whatever, it's like you were acting like a producer. It was your ideas, and there was the artist, and there you were together. And the very first record they gave me to they gave me to say, okay, go work with this guy. You're in. You're finally an in, you're finally an engineer. You can do this. His name is Bobby Lance, and he had written a hit record for this girl. Uh, this girl, this woman, Aretha Franklin. He had written this hit song, and then they gave me this guy. Well, <laughs> this first album that I did, the two of us, man, did we lock heads? It was the craziest, craziest, crazy. I'm a young kid, and I know what I want, and he's an artist, and he knows what he wants. And, you know, then there's nobody in charge. So the bigger story is life goes on. I do all these things. I turn to Tim and I make all this different music, everything. I walk in the elevator this morning, and right there in the elevator next to me is Bobby Lance. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's the first record I ever mixed, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. <laughs> I didn't expect that, Jimmy, but what I wanted to say, yes, he must have been 19, and I was maybe 21, something like that, and we did lock heads. <laughs> and it was, but I'll say, when he, a point that he made before about his protege who was, went to school, you could throw all that out, because this man learned from the real masters, Tommy Dowd, Arish Mardin, Gene Paul, these are all Hall of Fame uh, people. Unfortunately, two of them passed away. Tommy mixed Aretha, Eric Clapton. I mean, you know, if you know mixing, you'll know these names. And that's who he learned from. He, nobody taught him in a school. And my son now, who's, who's producing, he went to Berkeley College of Music, and he tells everyone that he worked with, forget everything you learned in college. It's not going to work. And Jimmy is 100% right. That's why I wanted to just emphasize that point. Anyway, yeah. he's the man, this guy. Yes, he is. Thank, thank you, Bobby. Aww. But here's, here's a school girl. I think that, I mean, I think that your schooling, as a matter of fact, I asked this of Demo one day. Right. I said to him while he was trying to make a guitar part and spending two hours to cut it together, I'm like, why don't you just pick the guitar and play the part? Well, he doesn't play guitar. Oh, it's like, oh, I see. Right. But he learned in school how to spend all that time, two hours, to make a guitar part. And said he had a guitar player who would have probably did it a lot better and made it sound better. But, and I said to him one day, do you really think that you benefited by school as opposed to teaching yourself how to do this? And he said to me, without a doubt. He just said, without a doubt. And he said it like with a stone face. So I'm asking you. You no, went to I, the same school. I went to Full Sail, yes. Right. And um, absolutely, I think... See, I entered engineering like ground zero. I mean, down to like, what is a condenser? What is a dynamic? What is a compressor? Like, I was ground zero. So by the time I graduated, I had such a great foundation to build on. And I think someone like myself, like I said, ground zero student, it, I definitely benefited from, from going to a school to learn. Now, when I, once I was out in the field, like I said, I got a foundation. Once I was out in the field, it was like building, 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 building blocks. I mean, you, you can't, there's only so much the schooling can kind of take you. It's being out there and getting put in front of the, you know, the clients and working. Even if you're just running in the, in the, in the studio um, and dropping off coffee and just kind of hearing the dynamic between 
everyone in the room is just that's like amazing. You know and what the I mean? Coffee, and the coffee order is not right. Yeah, the coffee. Well, yeah, I always got it right. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, education was really important. Um, I think some people they end, like they have a great background, but they don't have exactly a way in. So they go to education to try to get a way in, and then they still don't get a way in. So they get really frustrated. I mean, I think everybody's path is different. You know what I mean? Like I think some, you know, for some it works, and for some, you know. You got to really well, just apply yourself into finding what your way in is and not just kind of hoping it's going to fall out the sky or so it's kind of it's not what you know it's who you know but when you get to know who you know oh, they want to know what you know yes absolutely so you, you yeah. kind of got to do it <laughs> yeah I mean listen my first engineering that I did was with Missy and I was so bad I think I told you about this like Missy kicked me out the room <laughs> Because I was so slow to her standards. Like, I was like trying, you know, I was so nervous. And, you know, and I, I was so slow. She was like, get out the room. Like, you are killing my vibe. Like, you I need, I need, vibe. yeah, she was like, you are killing my vibe. <laughs> and, like, you know what that did? Other, I mean, it crushed me to pieces. But what that did is it lit something in me to be like, you know what? The next time, if I get a next time, I have the opportunity to engineer for her again. She'll never say that again to me again. And That's I literally just went day in, day out, just learning Pro Tools, learning everything I could about just engineering. And I had that opportunity again. And that's kind of how I got like my monkey or name. Like Miss Lago came from the next time I engineered with her, I was like so much faster. And she was like, oh my God, you're like a Marcy Lago. You know what I mean? Because, like, my name is Marcia. Anyway, there that's sort of where my name came from, was, like, her calling me Marcia Lago, and eventually it came to Miss Lago. But, yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Yes, yes. I don't have a question, per se, but I just wanted to say thank you, because speaking of schooling, I don't know if you remember, but uh, I met you at a studio at Full Sail, and you introduced me to Buffy Goodwin, and she got me a job at Record Plant. So. Hey. I love yeah. Buffy. Yeah. Congratulations. So I just wanted to say thank you. Of yeah. course. I'm so happy to hear so that. So, yeah, I got a, I got a job See? as a runner. Networking. So. Yeah. Networking is everything. You Getting know what coffee I mean? and all that. Absolutely. So. Sweet. I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. Over here. Buffy. Hi, guys. Hi. Um, Hello. So, I love both of you guys' stuff. But uh, I just wanted to say, so, like, I know that you were protege to Jimmy Douglas for, like, beginning of your career but it was there any part of your workflow that you've kept learning from jimmy or anything that you've also kind of cultivated yourself pretty much I don't understand the question. so she was saying anything that you learned from me that kind of goes with you now today in oh, your workflow well, yeah as far as work not workflow i i literally what i learned from jimmy was i just i, I like i literally learned how to understand frequencies he was so good at dialing in on like instruments and the right frequencies that I would literally be like, wow, how did he do that? You know what I mean? And the way he would compress and like, so like for me, I pick, that's what I picked up. You know what I mean? Like workflow, you know, once you kind of get into your own rhythm, the, the workflow becomes what you are, like how you work. So I think that's a little, you know, it's hard to kind of over all the years, but absolutely like the training of my ear came all from Jimmy all from Jimmy but he probably wouldn't know that because I was sitting so quietly in the back of the studio and I every time he would go for a bathroom break I would literally go and look at like okay what did he do to that snare you know what I mean so I would over mm. time try to figure out okay this is range what did he do to this you know horn like whatever it was whatever the sound was and I literally started tu tuning my ear that way um, what I would do was I would play a lot with oscillators to tune my ear to understanding frequencies and where instruments lied in, where vocals lied in, different ranges of vocals. And the frequent and the oscillator kind of really helped me to really understand that. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. I should bring that with along with me. <laughs> um, um, what I didn't know I didn't know you were doing that, but I, I thought you were gonna say the philosophy was I really and I say this to this day, nobody believes me, it's like I really don't spend that much time dialing in. I just trying to go for the fundamental because I really want to go home. I don't want to. No, I, I really. I don't know if you've ever tuned a snare drum. Anybody has ever tuned a snare drum? So the thing about tuning snare drums is it has always made me crazy because there's all these little degrations of like, and after a while I can't hear. I'm a really good relative 
I'm a really good relative pitch person. Once I hear a pitch, I can right away grab it and gravitate toward it. But if I, if I stay too long away from it, I lose sight of the pitch I had. So it's kind of like when I EQ and do stuff, I'm like, I go for the initial thing I thought I had. I go for it quickly, and I don't want to get too involved. Because when you get too involved, that's when you spend five days on a mix. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. It's true. Hello. Um, I feel like I know the obvious answer to this, but I'm working with an artist now. She's a good friend of mine, and I like care about the project, but I feel like the producer is a little too much in her ear, and the producer is a little too married to the rough, and I feel like objectively there's some things in the rough that I know is not great, but um, the producer keeps getting in the ear like, I think we just want it closer to the rough. Can we go closer to the rough? Like, How would you guys approach that when it's someone you care about as opposed to, oh, they're paying the rate, let me just get it done, do what they want, and like just keep them happy. Well, you know I mean? I'll tell you one thing. I, I'll tell you one thing I did, which which shouldn't be done again. There's a very famous, well, he's a very famous producer, and he got to me for about maybe 10, 15 mixes, and only and he for, he wouldn't show up for the sessions to to do the to fix it to remedy it, but he kept saying it's got to be closer to the rough. It's got to be closer to the rough. And I waited. He says, "Come over to this other studio where I'm." And there was about this many people in the room, and he says, "Let me hear the record." And he says, "Now play the rough." And he played the rough, and he goes, "You see." It should be closer to the rough. And like, we're talking 15 passes later, very famous guy went, so use the rough. I'm not doing this anymore. And I walked out. If it's that important. Yeah, that's a hard battle. You, you know, that's your rough. Otherwise, good, otherwise, good luck. <laughs> yeah, no, honestly, like, because that's a really rough battle. I think, you know, they, like what they call it, like demoitis, right? Like, they get so, you know, used to what that rough is and they're married to it. So it's really, really hard to kind of divert them otherwise. And I get that a lot. You know, it's like I get called to do a mix, I do the mix, and they're like, let me send you the rough mix. And I'm like, oh, here we go. Here we go. Oh, here we go. You know what I mean? So it's like, why did you even want it mixed? You know what I mean? Um, and it's so funny because sometimes I'm so tempted to just like, like just bounce their session and just like send it back and be like, here's the mix. But I can never do it. I haven't done it yet. But like, I'm like, I'm, I, it's like, you know, because I get so like, Argh! like, why are you like, I don't want to get whoever mixed it. To, uh, whoever roughed it to mix it you know what I mean right so right because I one thing about me is I don't like time being wasted like I'm really big on that like I'd rather don't waste my time I'd rather not make the money as long as you're not wasting my time because it's, it's like time is just way too much more valuable than the actual monetary so yeah Thanks. I hope that was helpful it really good luck <laughs> Thanks. By, by the way I, I won't mix a record if I don't have the rough I've just learned so much. I've, I've done this so many times so, with so many people. Okay. That's been interesting that you said that because I used to, I used to like mix records and not want to hear the rough, but I got so much feedback where it was like, well, can you listen to the rough? Right. So over the last few years, like I literally need a rough as well. Like I need a reference point right, it's like a blueprint. because I know now clients are only like, they want things to sound like the rough, but just more enhanced. So you have to interpret that. You know what I mean? So maybe find the interpretation in the media and in, in, in whatever that happy medium is. You know what I mean? Of what the rough would sound like, but with whatever notes that you have without it changing fully. Yeah. Can, I can enhance that, actually. What, what I would do is I would pick out of that mix, I would pick the one or two things, like you were saying, that are really, really wrong. And I'd work on, like anything else in life, I pick my battles and I'll go, you know what? I'm not going to get that and I'm not going to get that and I'm not going to get that. But I'm going to stand on these two things here because they're that important to me. And, you know, that's how I would approach it pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah that's basically what I've been trying. Yeah, cool. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. That's it. Oh. Good. Go for it. Speaking of the rough. I do the same. I actually get the reference and I ask them what it is that they're lacking, they're not hearing in my mix. They'll always say, I, I just want to hear more vocal. So I'll actually blend in more vocal on their reference, give oh, it back nice. to them, yeah. tell them I remixed it, and I'm known for my effects. So I just give them a splash of some dub sound. They hear that, they think it's an entirely different mix. They don't even know. I almost want to say, I don't even want credit. But that's the last question. Moving on, seeing how time is the essence. 
Are you guys following that four hour first print is magic rule that I hear a lot of you guys are? Printing that first mix in four hours. I didn't get the memo. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not a memo, but I know a lot of engineers are printing when they get to that first point where they want to get, they feel it's nice and they make a print. And usually they come back to that print because they kind of get that Speak feeling. more, I can't. They kind of get that vibe where it's not getting any better after their first print for reference. I know just like as if it's talking about that can't get any better than the reference. A lot of engineers are doing that and they're printing their reference and they're, they're finding that they come back to their first print that they've been referencing in their mix and finding that they never actually got any better and going with their first mix. Well, if, if I might, I'm going to interject one thing. So all of us are aware that with digital technology, you have the ability to... When you say the word print, I'm like, what, what's the difference? All you're doing is a bunch of things. You saved it as a, a pass. You can do that all day long. You can have 15 versions if you want to. There's no loss. Right. I still come from my head when I didn't have automation. When I made the mix, it was a mix. And it wasn't going to be that way ever again. So when you want to make changes, you're going to lose some other things because of what the changes you want. So you got to figure out how important that is, those changes you want. Because you're going to lose some other shit. I can't possibly do all those things again. Not exactly the same way. But we live in an age now when anybody can sit all day long in the studio. You do it. And you get everything exactly right. You spend five days doing this. Right? Well, I spent five days doing it. I wanted to sound like what I spent five days doing. That's what I want. It's, it's, it's a different art. You know, so I, I'm, I hate to be on their side, but I, I finally get it. Yeah, so it's kind of like everybody has their own workflow and their own methodology, huh? Right, right. And, and they spend of course, the, yeah. and they spend a lot of hours getting it to where they wanted it, and so your job, I think, as a mixer, is to let them have what they had, and like she said, expand it, enhance it, but it's got to look the same. A lot of work went into that. Hopefully, yeah. I mean, it's easy when you get a piece of something nobody really spent any work on. It's really easy to mix that better. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Any? That's it. Okay. No, well. I think First of all, welcome to Nam, appreciate it. I got a question for you. When you're a traveling engineer and you're not necessarily in the same studio all the time mixing, how do you get over the initial hump of new equipment that you necessarily haven't been in front of? Although you be it, you know a console, you know where the EQs and things are, but how do you get over the hump of always listening in different monitors? I mean, I'm sure at this stage in the game Always you guys, listening? Sorry. Okay, my question was, I'm a traveling engineer, okay. so I normally go to my clients. Correct. And my question is, how do you get over the hump of always having new monitors, a new console, or a control panel? Like, what? Yeah. How, how, a, how did you get over that in your career? That, that's a great question. I spent a lot of my years, um, when I first started mixing, I was literally traveling between, like, L.A., New York, Atlanta, Vegas, Paris, whatever. Um, and it was rough, but you have to... First of all, you gotta you gotta know the room, and I, the only way you can kind of know the room is by listening to songs and that you can reference and understand. Um, I literally, and I don't know if he's still around. I'm not really trying to like. I mean, I, like you know, Tom Loralgi, like his mixes to me were like the mixes to like really Jimmy's uh, Missy Elliott's Get Your Freak On, the mix that I would reference the room for bottom. Um, Tom Loralgi's Al like Avril, Le Avril Levine mixes. It was the room that I would like literally like test the room out for other you know highs and mids and whatnot. So you have to have music that you know that you can recognize that if you play it back in that room, you're like oh this you know like the bass sounds really weird here, or the high end is like oh it's off. So you kind of have to really adjust yourself. You know what I mean? Traveling not my favorite years you know what I mean it's really rough because it's, it's a hard thing to do where you're like constantly being in different rooms monitors you know what I mean and the only other way you can alleviate that is if you bring all the equipment with you and that's a lot of work you know what I mean so honestly it's just referencing the room is gonna be key and really understanding what that room sounds like because then you can compensate and understand like okay I know what to do based off of what the room is doing Do you have something you want to add? Oh, no. Um, well, 
I have this handy device here that tells everything. It's called an iPhone. And uh, <laughs> I'm just being silly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope that was helpful. Okay. So, so any yeah. other questions? You know, there will, there will be tests tomorrow, you guys. <laughs> no. So um, I guess we're good here. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, guys <laughs> and girls. Oh, they took it off. That's pretty good. You did just look. Boy, now I'm not going to mix the record now.